So it's a big topic, the Upanishads and world philosophy. In fact, I didn't know which particular Upanishad to talk about when I was asked to give a talk. I've already spoken about the Isha and uh, Kena Upanishads here at Sakar in the last couple of years. And I didn't have another particular Upanishad in mind, but at present I'm teaching a course on world philosophy, which involves comparisons between Eastern and Western philosophy, including, of course, the Upanishads. So I realized that that would be a convenient topic uh, for this occasion because I can draw on material that I've been using for my class on world philosophy. Now, world philosophy, properly speaking, includes a lot of things which I'm not intending to include. I couldn't possibly cover in an hour. In practice, what I mean is Eastern and Western philosophy. Eastern philosophy represented primarily by Indian philosophy for our purpose, and Western in ancient times by Greek philosophy. And the whole history of Western philosophy has uh, been a continuation of what began with the pre-Socratic philosophers in Greece. Now, Sri has some very interesting things to say about the divergence between Greek and Indian philosophies in ancient times, beginning around the time of the Upanishads. And so, with regard to uh, the Upanishads and the ancient world, I'll focus on that divergence between uh, the philosophies of Greece and India. But I don't want to talk just about the past, and so at the end I'll come to the question of the last couple of centuries and even looking ahead into the future and the role of the Upanishads, because after this long divergence between East and West, now with globalization, the whole world is coming together again. East and West uh, are coming together. And so this divergence is, to some extent, being overcome. The differences between East and West are being reduced. And in that context, the Upanishads have already played a significant role role in the last couple of centuries, but I believe are destined to play a much more important role uh, in the future, hopefully in the near future. Now, I've made certain selections of writings from Sri I tried to keep them as short as possible, but on the other hand, I don't like to chop up Sri writings uh, too much. And also, I wanted to give you something you can take home from this. And so I won't go over all of this material here because there's not time. And I want to leave some time for questions at the end. So uh, I'll use this material that uh, has been sent to you, which presumably you have on your tablets or whatever. Uh, as a kind of outline of what I want to talk about. Uh, some of it uh, I'll read because nobody can express things as well as Sri Aurobindo, and so it's a shame to put, in, put badly in my own words what is, has been put perfectly by Sri Aurobindo in his words. So I'll read some of these passages. Others I'll summarize or refer to, and you can read them on your own. Now, to begin with, uh, the Upanishads, of course, represent an early stage in the development of Indian spirituality. They are referred to as Vedanta, uh, which literally means the end of the Vedas, uh, the end of the Veda or Vedas. And uh, the Upanishads are the end of the Vedic literature. At the same time, the Upanishads 
are distinct from the Veda proper, particularly in Sri Aurobindo's writings. Very often the, the, the term Veda is used very loosely to refer to Veda and Upanishads and often people mean when they talk about Veda, they, mean, they really mean the Upanishads more than the Veda uh, proper. But Sri Aurobindo was very particular about making that distinction and especially because he devoted a great deal of time to uh, discovering the key to the meaning of the most ancient Vedic texts, particularly the Rig Veda. And the Rig Veda is qu quite uh, a different kind of text from the Upanishads, even though there's a continuity between them. The, con the, the Upanishads look back to the Veda, but they also look forward to the age of the later philosophies, such as Vedanta, in the sense that it came to mean uh, the Vedanta of the philosophers, such as Shankara, uh, Ramanuja, Madhva, uh, Advaita Vedanta, Vishishta Advaita, Dwaita Advaita, the later schools of philosophy, and of course other philosophies, Sankhya, and so on. All of that represents philosophy proper. The Upanishads represent a transition between the Vedic age and the age of what Sherpano calls the intellectual philosophies. In this first passage, he says, Veda, and this is a passage taken from the secret of the Veda, which is it's taken from the introduction to his commentary on the uh, the Rig Veda. Veda then is the creation of an age anterior, that is prior, earlier, to our intellectual philosophies. In that original epoch, thought preceded by other methods than those of our logical reasoning, and speech accepted modes of expression which in our modern habits would be inadmissible. This was particularly true of the most ancient Vedic uh, texts, but it remains true to some extent of the Upanishads, especially the older Upanishads, such as the the, the long prose Upanishads, the Brihadaranyaka and the Chandogya. The Upanishads, in fact, cover a fairly long period of several centuries, and in a certain sense, even continued to this day. Sri Aurobindo himself wrote an Upanishad in Sanskrit. Uh, early, soon after he came to Pondicherry, and that was part of a certain tradition of writing Upanishads, which continued. But usually when we talk about the Upanishads, we're talking about a dozen or so principal Upanishads, which represent a very ancient period, uh, which is difficult to date, and it's not really necessary uh, to date it. We'll come a little bit to a question of dating uh, later on, but in any case, uh, it rep the Upanishads represent this transition which in its later stages coincided with the origin of Buddhism, Jainism, and uh, the formulation of, of some of the Indian uh, intellectual philosophies. But the most characteristic Upanishads belong to a period which is still predominantly the expression of an intuitive mind rather than an intellectual reason. Uh, this Sherbin refers to that in the next sentence. The wisest then depended on inner experience and the suggestions of the intuitive mind for all knowledge that went beyond mankind's ordinary perceptions and daily activities. Their aim was illumination, not logical conviction. Their ideal, the inspired seer, not the accurate reasoner. Now, he's going to point out how, to a certain extent, Indian philosophy kept something of the spirit of what was established in the age of the Veda and Upanishads to a greater degree than uh, other uh, the philosophies in other parts of the world, and particularly the one uh, 
uh, which forms the most obvious contrast, namely Greek philosophy. And Sherbindo knew uh, Greek, of course. He was, had read quite a bit of Greek philosophy in the original and was well qualified to make that uh, comparison. In fact, he wrote a whole book, a small book, on one of the uh, ancient Greek philosophers, Heraclitus, one of the pre-Socratic philosophers. And so uh, Shorbindo has gives us quite a bit of insight into how Greek and Indian philosophies developed in different ways. The difference goes back, no doubt, to the um, character of the Veda, but even more to the, the nature of the Upanishads, because according to Sri interpretation of the Veda, the Veda belonged to an age of mystics, of mysticism, the mystery religions. He sometimes simply calls it the age of the mysteries, which was represented also in other parts of the world, although we know much less about the mystery religions in uh, ancient Greece, Egypt, and so on, because no text like the Rig Veda has survived. But there were the uh, Eleusinian, uh, Orphic and Eleusinian mysteries in Greece. There were the Egyptian uh, mystery religions. And all of those, Shribindo believed, in, uh, expressed this intuitive mentality which, uh, which we see in the Veda, which belongs to an age anterior to all of the intellectual philosophies. Uh, but things develop differently in different parts of the world. And particularly in Greece, uh, philosophy developed in quite a different way from India, except that in the beginning, um, there was still quite a bit in common, and I'll come to that uh, in a moment. Uh, the next point I want to make is having accepted that the Veda and Upanishads, Veda and Vedanta, represent the origins of Indian spirituality, Indian thought and, and culture, and are generally regarded also as, in a certain sense, the high point uh, in, the, in the human cycle, Shribindo starts off by describing a sort of decline from the Vedic age. He uses, although the human cycle is, refers to social development uh, throughout the world, in, he refers is the human cycle. He uses the example of India particularly to um, explain what he means by the symbolic age. And when you look at the transition from the symbolic to the typal and conventional ages that follow, there seems to be a decline. A certain knowledge was possessed and expressed in uh, the symbolic language of uh, the Rig Veda, reformulated more, more intellectually, but still primarily through the intuitive mind in the Upanishads, but then the intellectual philosophy seemed to involve some kind of loss of the original uh, exalted spirituality of the Veda and Upanishads. So does that mean that, that history is a story of decline? In fact, that was the traditional view of history in most of the world, not only in India with the idea of Satya Yuga, uh, Treta Dwapara Kali Yuga, which is obviously uh, a decline from the Satya Yuga to the Kali Yuga, but also in ancient Greece, uh, history was um, divided up into the golden, uh, the golden age, the bronze, uh, golden, silver, bronze, and iron ages. Not those have nothing to do with modern archaeological terms like Bronze Age, but uh, were distinguished just in terms of the relative value of the different metals, gold being the most precious and, and iron the, the least. So this was also uh, a process of decline. The ancient Greeks also generally saw uh, 
history as a decline from, uh, from a, an original golden age. And so does that mean that uh, in putting forward this theory that Tribundo is going against the idea of evolution, which means that there should be progress, that uh, the, the course of history should be progressive uh, if, if uh, there's a spiritual evolution. Uh, of course, it doesn't necessarily follow from the, from the Darwinian uh, idea of evolution, which supposedly, or neo-Darwinian, which supposedly is a random process which need not lead to progress. But in Tribundo's philosophy of evolution, uh, life in this world is a progressive manifestation of the spirit. So why does there seem to be a decline? Well, he uses this phrase, an enriching descent, to describe what happened uh, from the Veda and Upanishads to the period of the intellectual philosophies, the development of sciences also, because India was very advanced, as advanced as any other uh, civilization in science and mathematics in uh, ancient times. He describes uh, this evolution as an enriching descent, an evolution so begun uh, with this uh, revelation contained in the uh, Veda and Upanishads had to proceed by a sort of enriching descent from spirit to matter and to pass on first to an intellectual endeavor to see life and the world and the self in all their relations as they present themselves to the reason, reasoning and the practical intelligence. So that gives some clue that something is gained. The intelligence, the intellect develops. Even though there's a decline in spiritual knowledge, there's a great development of the intellect, there's a great cultural development in Indian classical civilization. Uh, so India created one of the great civilizations of the ancient world as represented uh, by uh, the time of Kalidasa and, uh, and so on, the great uh, architecture and sculpture and art and literature of, uh, and philosophy also of that period. It was one of the great classical ages. But still, it seems to be a decline, and this by itself doesn't seem to explain why there was a decline from the, the uh, period of the Veda and Upanishads. That, he explains in a crucial chapter in the human cycle. The extract I've made from this chapter is a little bit long, and I won't be able to go into all the details, but it's the chapter called The Infrarational Age, of the cycle, and he makes a point which is necessary for understanding exactly the position of the Veda and the Upanishads in Tribunda's vision in relation to uh, the later development. He explains, and it seems almost shocking to begin with, that this great civilization of ancient India belonged to what Shrebinu calls the infrarational stage of society. Infra meaning below. That society as a whole, this is the crucial phrase, as a whole had not yet reached a fully rational stage of development in the mass. Uh, in this stage, he explains, in this stage, pure reason and pure spirituality will not govern the society or move large bodies of men, but will be re represented, if at all, by individuals, at first few, but growing in number as these two powers increase in their purity and vigor. These two powers meaning reason and spirituality. Spirituality, especially in India, reason uh, most characteristically in Greece, but of course uh, also in India. But in any case, uh, they uh, in spite of uh, the apparent decline, uh, the number uh, the, the 
a proportion of the society that participates in the development of reason and spirituality gradually increases. This is what Sri refers to at one point in the life divine as two principles behind uh, the workings of the process of evolution in humanity, the principle of concentration and the principle of diffusion. Uh, this is in one of the, the, the later chapters, he points out that at certain times a great progress has been made by concentrating the effort in a small number of individuals. And this was the case in the Vedic age because in fact the inner meaning of the Veda was confined to a relatively small class of initiates. Whereas the, uh, the mass of the people had no idea of the inner symbolic spiritual meaning uh, of the Veda. They followed uh, a popular form of the religion which involved a certain ritualism, a worship of nature, uh, deities as in other parts of the world and so on. And the inner meaning of the Veda was not revealed to the mass of the people because they were not yet ready for it. So the whole key to uh, this uh, a par paradox that the high point of Indian civilization belonged to a lower stage of collective development seen in the mass uh, is explained when you realize that it's a question of uh, the whole of society eventually being destined to be first rationalized and then spiritualized. And for the fulfillment of uh, the destiny of humanity as a whole, these developments cannot be confined to a few. They have to be spread to all. So this is uh, how uh, Sri Aurobindo com combines two views of history which have generally been seen as contradictory. One is the theory of cycles as in the Indian theory of the decline from the Satya Yuga to the Kali Yuga. Of course, uh, that cycle repeats itself. So somehow you get from the Kali Yuga to the Satya Yuga. But uh, the uh, effect of the theory of the Yugas, because we're caught somewhere in the early stages of the Kali Yuga, is to give the sense of uh, uh, history as a process of decline and nobody quite knows how, how we're going to get from the uh, Kali Yuga to another Satya Yuga. Uh, likewise other theories as in the Greek theory of the bronze, uh, the, the gold, silver, bronze and iron ages, uh, no one seems to quite know unless it's by some kind of miraculous divine in intervention how we're going to uh, reach again a higher level and start the cycle over again. So generally the cyclical theory is regarded as one of decline, but the Western theory of history has generally viewed history as uh, linear in the sense of an arrow which moves uh, at least the modern uh, Western, not, not in ancient times as I said, but the modern theory of progress the idea of progress, which is actually a fairly new idea in terms of an idea of collective progress as opposed to individual spiritual progress, which of course was always recognized in, in, in India at least. Progress, one can progress spiritually from one life to another, but uh, society itself was not generally viewed as progressing. And so Sherbindo combines these theories by explaining uh, how the development uh, from this earliest stage uh, of the, uh, this infrarational stage in which reason and spirituality have emerged only uh, in uh, the thought and experience of individuals. He goes on to describe, he, he describes Greece and India 
side by side, um, starting with Greece in this paragraph, this may well lead to an age, if the development of reason is strongest, as in Greece, of great individual thinkers who seize on some idea of life and its origins and laws and erect that into a philosophy. Such an age seems to be represented by the traditions of the beginnings of Greek civilization. This is this period he's talking about is the period of the pre-Socratic philosophers. Uh, Socrates, at the end of the f the uh, fifth century the, uh, B.C. in Athens, represented the end and culmination of uh, of a period which began with the pre-Socratic philosophers. Uh, uh, you may or may not be familiar with some of the names, uh, Thales, uh, there are several that are very hard to, dis to keep straight, Anaximander, Anaximenes, and Anaxagoras, <laughs> they all sound pretty much the same, Parmenides, Empedocles, Pythagoras, of course, is a, a very famous and important one. Uh, later on, you have uh, Zeno, I'll talk about a couple of these in a moment, but these were individual philosophers. Each came up with his own theory of existence and these theories were quite distinct. So this is the age of uh, beginnings of Greek thought. Or if spirituality predominates, there will be great mystics capable of delving into the profound and still occult possibilities of our nature and so on. Here he first describes the Vedic age. He says, in prehistoric India, we see it take a peculiar and unique turn which determined the whole future trend of the society and made Indian civilization a thing apart and of its kind in the history of the human race. But these things are only a first beginning of light in the midst of a humanity which is still infra-rational as well as infra-spiritual in the mass. So this is why it was necessary for there, there to be, uh, and he'll explain it even more clearly in the next paragraph, why a certain descent from the heights reached in the Vedic age uh, and continued in the age of the Upanishads, why that certain descent uh, was necessary. He explains how as reason and spirituality develop, they begin to become a larger and more diffused force. This is what he called the principle of diffusion in the life divine. That uh, the concentrated effort as in the Vedic age had at a certain point to give way to a principle of diffusion so that that knowledge could spread through the rest of society. And that is a much slower process. It's taken uh, centuries, even thousands of years for uh, the rest of Indian society to catch up uh, in a certain sense with the vanguard, the achievements of the ancient uh, leaders of uh, Indian civilization. So the mystics become the sowers of the seed of an immense spiritual development in which whole classes of society and even men from all classes seek the light as happened in India in the age of the Upanishads. You see that in some of the uh, uh, older prose Upanishads, the Brihad Aranyaka and Chandogya Upanishads, which describe scenes of the rishis and their ashrams. And you have kings, uh, but also you have people, as he says, from all classes. Satya, the story of Satyakama Jabali, who couldn't even say who his father was. Uh, was an example of, of that. It wasn't only Brahmins and, and Kshatriyas, but uh, people from all classes. So uh, this was uh, the uh, diffusion, the beginning of this process of diffusion began in the age of the Upanishads and it went much further as we'll see uh, when we come to uh, this passage on the spirituality of the Indian people uh, in a few minutes. The solitary, now he comes to the, to the Greeks, the solitary individual thinkers like Thales, Pythagoras, etc., are replaced by a great number of writers, poets, thinkers, rhetoricians, sophists, scientific inquirers who pour out a profuse 
flood of acute speculation and inquiry, stimulating the thought habit and creating, even in the mass, a generalized activity of the intelligence, as happened in Greece in the age of the sophists. This led up to Socrates, who is the key figure of that period, but in Athens and elsewhere in Greece uh, in the fourth century BC, there was this general uh, intellectual uh, activity which uh, uh, made possible the birth of democracy, even though it was a fairly limited democracy in Athens. Um, in which, uh, for example, slaves and women were not in, included. But nevertheless, it was the beginning of some kind of generalized activity of the intelligence. So you have the principle of diffusion at work in the case of both reason and spirituality, particularly in Greece and India, respectively. Although in India also, reason was developing. Uh, so. He explains then why this was necessary, how it was possible uh, for the vanguard, so to speak, in the Vedic age to uh, overleap, so to speak, the natural development from the infrarational to the rational to the suprarational. What happened was that without fully going through the intermediate stage of the development of the rational mind, uh, the Vedic rishis had, through the power of their intuition, uh, been able to leap directly from an infrarational intuition to a deeper spiritual intu intuition. But, as Sri says, this which is an easy passage in the individual man is a movement which cannot last for humanity as a whole. The mind and intellect must develop to their fullness so that the spirituality of the race may rise securely upward upon a broad basis of the developed lower nature in man, the intelligent mental being. This is the key to understanding how Sri combines a, a linear ascending view of history from infrarational to rational to, to suprarational for humanity as a whole with a view of cycles in which there's a temporary decline, actually Sri view of history is best represented by a spiral. And that's the image which he uses in a number of places in his writings, in which there's an ascent, but there's also a decline in order to uh, f make possible a further descent to the next cycle. So there are loops which are like circles in which there seems to be a decline and a retrogression so it goes back, down and back, and yet it does so only to go up and forward again and reach a new height. So the, the spiritual age to come, the new Satya Yuga, will not just be a, repeti a repetition of the old Satya Yuga. It won't be just a return to the symbolic age of the Vedas, because all of this development that has occurred in between through the process of diffusion uh, will make possible a much broader advance and the possibility of spiritualizing humanity as a whole and not only spiritualizing parts of humanity. Likewise, intellectualizing only parts of humanity in ancient times could be rationalized and intellectualized. Now the whole of humanity is uh, for the first time being educated at least, which is the first step towards universal uh, intellectual, rational development, some kind of development of the reason. And this, he says, is necessary as a broad basis of the developed lower nature before there can be uh, a new spiritual age. So he then ends this passage uh, by saying, therefore we see that the reason in its growth either does away with the distinct spiritual tendency for a time as in ancient Greece because the spiritual tendency was there in the pre-Socratic philosophers. They, the pre-Socratic philosophers also uh, looked back to the age of the mysteries and preserved some elements of the mystery religions, more in some cases than in, like Pythagoras, who was a mystic uh, as well as uh, a mathematician and philosopher. Uh, but uh, Heraclitus 
Shobindo also shows, the, the reason for the uh, apparent obscurity and paradoxical nature of Heraclitus's aphorisms was that he was half mystic and half intellectual. So this, but this distinct spiritual tendency after Plato more or less disappeared from Greece, from Greek thought. Plato's student was Aristotle. And Aristotle developed logic and developed the beginnings of many sciences. He was the father of science, as Plato had been the father of modern philosophy. Socrates, uh, of course, was Plato's teacher. So the three Socrates, Plato and Aristotle, determined the further course of Western, the whole of Western thought. And that meant for a few centuries the uh, disappearance of a distinct spiritual tendency. It came back in around the third century AD with uh, Plotinus and the Neoplatonists. And uh, that developed later on in, into Christian mysticism. Every account of the history of Christian mysticism begins with Plato and Plotinus because you can't understand uh, the mystical philosophies of, uh, of the Western world uh, based on Christianity without uh, seeing how the philosophies of Plato and Plotinus have been uh, synthesized with the Hebrew uh, religious vision uh, taken from, from the, uh, the Jewish and Christian uh, scriptures. So uh, in Greece, the distinct spiritual tendency was done away with for a time. In India, the other alternative is that the distinct spiritual tendency could be accepted. It accepts it, but spins out around its first data and activities a vast web of the workings of the intelligence. So that, as in India, the early mystic seer, the mystic seer, that's the seer of the Veda, um, uh, as, as he said, the, uh, the uh, uh, intuitive uh, the rishi rather than the thinker. The mystic seer, the early mystic seer of the Veda is replaced by the philosopher mystic. The philosopher mystic begins uh, to appear in the Upanishads. The, in the early Upanishads, the rishis are still more mystics than philosophers, but the element of philosophical intellectual thought increases with time I, in the age of the Upanishads. Then this leads to an age of the religious thinker and even the philosopher pure and simple. The philosopher pure and simple comes in a few centuries later with philosophies like Nyaya, the philosophy of logic by Sheshika, uh, and uh, other, uh, uh, other philosophies, of course, uh, uh, Sankhya and, and Yoga uh, were intellectual formulations of, of basically spiritual knowledge. But in any case, uh, the philosopher pure and simple did actually develop in, in India in, uh, in the extreme development of this tendency. But it was not the characteristic development of uh, philosophy in India. Um, I'll just give now, a f since we've seen the general uh, comparison between what happened in India in the age of the Upanishads and what happened in Greece in the age of the pre-Socratic philosophers. I'll just give a couple of examples. Uh, let me uh, just take uh, one, I'll take one phrase from the Isha Upanishad, an aged ekam, one unmoving the first words of the fourth verse of the Isha Upanishad, one unmoving. It continues, an aged ekam manaso javiyo nainat deva apnuvan purva marshat tadhavato nyan atiyeti tishthat. The last part we can leave out, but it's concerned with, uh, Shurabhinder translates it, one unmoving that is swifter than mind, that the gods reach not, for it progresses ever in front that standing passes beyond others as they run. Now this sounds very strange and illogical. How can one who is unmoving be swifter than mind? Uh, how can that which stands, tishtat, uh, 
uh, pass beyond others who are running, dhavato. Now, what's very striking is what the Greeks have done with a very similar idea. I'll uh, talk about two uh, pre-Socratic philosophers, Parmenides and Zeno. Uh, Parmenides uh, lived in the early 5th century BC and Zeno a generation later more or less in the mid, mid, middle of the 5th century BC. That means a generation or two before the sophists and uh, Socrates. Parmenides proved that change is impossible. He was uh, known for the logical way that he uh, set about doing this. I won't go into how Parmenides uh, proves it. But if change is impossible, his, his theory was that there is only one unmoving reality, in other words, an aged ekam. This You could translate Parmenides' view of reality using this phrase uh, from the Isha Upanishad. So according to Parmenides, there is just one undifferentiated unity, and it does nothing except exist. In other words, it's sat, nothing but sat. This is the nature of the ultimate reality. Uh, I won't go further into that, but this leads uh, to the conclusion that nothing can happen. Not all the appearances that we see are the illusions of the senses, that actually there's only one unmoving reality and nothing is changing. Now, what's very striking about the way the Greeks took up an idea like this, of course, the defect of Parmenides' philosophy is that he didn't do a very good job of combining this with uh, the fact that obviously uh, the world is in constant change. The Isha Upanishad, uh, that's in a sense the central idea of the Isha Upanishad, how to harmonize these two. It begins with uh, Jagat Yam Jagat, uh, the, the, that the uh, all Isha Vas Yamidam Sarvam Yatkincha Jagat Yam Jagat, the world is seen as a uh, universe of movement in the universal motion. The whole world is in movement and within that universal motion, each individual also is in motion. We aren't usually aware of that or weren't until the development of modern science, but now that we know that everything consists of tiny whirling atoms and uh, which are kind of a microcosm of the cosmic whirl, the solar system is sort of replicated at the level of the atom, which is like jagat yam uh, jagat, the, the, the little movement inside the big movement. Um, the, so the Isha Upanishad combines and harmonizes these two, which Parmenides was unable to do. Zeno took up Parmenides' idea, and he proved it in a very striking way. Almost a, he, he gave almost a mathematical proof of the impossibility of change and movement, which are, uh, it's a number of, there are a number of variations, but these are referred to as Zeno's paradoxes. Uh, the most famous was that of Achilles and the tortoise, uh, which is a forerunner of the, the story about the tortoise and the hare. But this, uh, Achilles' paradox is that Achilles is to compete in a foot race with a tortoise. So naturally, because he knows he's much faster than the tortoise, he gives the tortoise a head start and plans to catch up with it. When Achilles leaves his starting line, the tortoise is already some distance ahead, has moved from its original starting point. So it will take Achilles some time, not very long perhaps, to reach the point from which the tortoise is starting out. Now the problem is that this can go on forever because every time Achilles covers the distance between himself and the tortoise at this moment, the tortoise has already moved on, if only uh, a little bit. and how is Achilles ever going to pass the tortoise? This is uh, using a certain uh, uh, logic, kind of logic, it seems impossible. Uh, there, of course, there are many uh, solutions. People have been thinking about these paradoxes now for, for uh, hundreds and thousands of years, and they remain uh, uh, rather challenging. There are many ways of solving the problem. But the point is that uh, the Greek way of approaching the same paradox of the one unmoving 
uh, and its relation to everything uh, that moves is very strikingly different from the Indian way of dealing with the same theme. I won't e spend any more time on that, but the, the Greeks have turned it into a mathematical uh, problem, basically a logical problem. Uh, that leads me to um, uh, the next idea, which is, as I said, Aristotle formulated uh, logic, uh, the logic which uh, Western thought has been based on ever since Aristotle with some recent uh, modifications, but by and large uh, Western thought has, has uh, accepted Aristotle's logic, which is the logic of the finite. Uh, which is based on the fact that two contradictory statements cannot both be true. And one can also put it mathematically, for, one, for, for example, uh, according to the mathematics of uh, the finite, which is what we usually mean by mathematics, um, one plus one equals two. It can't equal one. Likewise, one minus one equals zero. You can't still have one if you subtract one from one. But um, the strange thing is, it turns out it was discovered in the 19th century by a German mathematician named Cantor that um, transfinite numbers, uh, which is a way of talking about inf infinity in mathematical terms, uh, don't obey this logic. So you can add infinity plus infinity and you still have exactly the same infinity as you started with. You can subtract infinity from infinity and you still have infinity. Now, of course, there's a famous verse in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, Purnamada, Purnamidam, Purnat Purnamudachyate, Purnasya Purnamadaya, Purnamayabhavashishyate. It's exactly the logic or the mathematics of the infinite. Um, in fact, Purna, it means whole, full, complete, integral, all of these things. Um, sometimes it's trans translated infinite. Whether, whichever way you translate it, the fact is that the Upanishad says that is Purna, this is Purna. Uh, the Purna comes out of, emerges from, proceeds from the Purna. When you take Purna away from the Purna, uh, the Purna remains. Now this is like subtracting infinity from infinity and you still have infinity, but it doesn't work with finite numbers. If you just subtract one minus one, because one also can be taken to represent Purna, but obviously one minus one equals zero, it doesn't equal one. And yet, according to the logic of, of the infinite, things work quite differently. And this, of course, is an idea that Sherbinder developed. There's a particularly one chapter in the Life Divine, the chapter called Brahman Purusha Ishwara. It's a long chapter in which he refers uh, repeatedly to the logic of the infinite. And he even he compares it, in fact, he says that in order to understand the fundamental aspects in which we see and experience the omnipresent reality. A language has to be created, which is at once intuitively metaphysical and revealingly poetic. A language such as we find hammered out into a subtle and pregnant massiveness in the Veda and the Upanishads. So, uh, Shurabindu finds this, uh, he goes on then to say that one can uh, also uh, express these ideas in the ordinary tongue of metaphysical thought, but uh, to be of real service, the intellect must consent to pass out of the bounds of a finite logic and accustom itself to the logic of the infinite. And so he goes on to discuss in several passages uh, exactly what he means uh, by the logic uh, of the infinite. What is magic to our finite reason is the logic of the infinite. So it's a perfectly intelligible view of reality, but it's based on a different logic. And by and large, the Upanishads developed the logic of the infinite at the time when the Greeks, although they experimented with paradoxes, which they weren't uh, 
able, really able to resolve, ended up settling upon a logic of the finite, Aristotle's logic, which ended up governing Western thought, dominating uh, Western thought for most of the last uh, couple of millennia. So this uh, gives just a couple of examples of how Greek and Indian philosophy uh, dealt with some of the same basic problems of existence, but they dealt with them in quite different ways, and the results ended up quite divergent. Uh, now, uh, I think I won't really have time to go much into Indian philosophy after the Upanishads. I've taken one passage in which Sri uh, talks about this process of the development of intellectual philosophies, uh, which yet kept some continuity with the origins of Indian thought in the intuitive vision of the Upanishads, although, as he said, there is indeed a tendency of fragmentation and exclusiveness. The great integral truth of the Upanishads has already been broken into divergent schools of thought, and these are now farther subdividing into less comprehend comprehensive systems. And yet, these philosophers were still, many of them, at the same time, yogins. And it was this combination of philosophy and yoga, as you see in uh, philosophies like the Sankhya, the yoga philosophy itself, the, the schools of Vedanta, the Ved Vedantic philosophies, uh, which were uh, relied very much on rational methods of argument, and yet, in the end, uh, what they uh, establish is uh, uh, spiritual realizations, if not the most uh, integral realizations. Uh, for example, the, uh, the basic uh, statement of Advaita Vedanta, Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya. It's not just a philosophical statement. Brahma, a Brahman is the truth, the world is false. Uh, it's a philosophical statement which Shankara establishes by rigorous logic. And yet, it's also a certain spiritual realization, even if it's a complete, an incomplete and one-sided realization. Still, it is a realization. Sri Aurobindo himself went through that realization of the Nirguna Brahman in which the world seemed for some time to his experience to be uh, uh, happening as if it was on, on a screen uh, like a film. And of course, when he talks about a cinematographic play of vacant forms, he's talking about the very early ages of the development of uh, films, uh, the silent films which were very unreal and the, the way he saw the world after his realization of the Nirguna Brahman was uh, in those terms in which the world seemed uh, completely unreal. So that is not just a philosophical conclusion as it might have been in the case of a Western philosophy. But in Shankara's case, no doubt Shankara also had a spiritual experience which uh, was behind his, his philosophy. So let's go on uh, briefly to a very uh, interesting point uh, about the impact of this on the Indian people as a whole, because we're still talking about philosophers, and naturally not too many people were directly uh, affected by the philosophy of uh, Shankara. His writings were no doubt accessible uh, only to those who knew Sanskrit and were uh, highly educated, mostly uh, Brahmins probably. And yet, uh, something else uh, happened in India, which Sri Aurobindo describes in this passage, um, uh, where he says that Indian culture succeeded in stamping religion with the essential idea of a real, essential ideal of a real spirituality. It brought some living reflection of the very highest spiritual truth and some breadth of its influence into every part of the religious field, and this included the popular religion. The ideas of Maya, Leela, divine immanence, 
uh, as familiar to the man in the street and the worshiper in the temple as to the philosopher in his seclusion, the monk in his monastery, and the saint in his hermitage. So how was this uh, done? He talks about how the people of India, even the, quote, ignorant masses, have this distinction that they are, by centuries of training, nearer to the inner realities, are divided from them by a less thick veil of the universal ignorance, and are more easily led back to vital glimpses of God and spirit, uh, self and eternity, than the mass of men or even the cultured elite anywhere else. He gives some examples, Buddha, Tukaram, Ram Prasad, Kabir, the Sikh gurus, the Tamil saints. There's one example which I wanted to give, uh, which I came across when I was studying Tamil in Madurai uh, many years ago, uh, which is not even on the letter, level of literature of the works that uh, Shrivindo mentions here. It's from the Thiruvilayadal Puranam, which is, Vilayadal is the Tamil word corresponding to Leela, play. Vilayadal means the, the play, the, the sports uh, of, in this case, Shiva, not Krishna. We associate Leela mostly with Krishna, but uh, there's a story, a popular story, uh, which is uh, told in this Purana about uh, the flooding of the Vaigai River uh, in one year, and the king, Arimardana Pandyan, ordered his ministers to take urgent steps to control the floods. So all the citizens were asked to close a portion of the breach in the river. Every citizen of Madurai was given responsibility for closing a certain por portion of the breach through which the river was flooding the city. Now, there was an old woman named Bandi who sold rice pudding for a living. Uh, on hearing the king's orders, she did not know what to do to close the portion of the river bund allotted to her. So she prayed to the Lord for help. Lord Sundareswara took pity on Vandi and manifested himself as a young laborer with a dirty piece of cloth around his waist, a basket on his head, and a shovel on his shoulder. So uh, to skip over some of the details, uh, he got himself accepted as Vandi's, this old woman's representative, to uh, close the portion of the river bond which was allotted to her. But then, instead of working seriously, he indulged in playful activities. Uh, Leela's like Krishna's, uh, the child, those associated with the child Krishna. So when everybody else por everyone else's portion of the bond was taken care of, Vandis remained unattended to. So the king's men were enraged but could not punish the youth as they were mesmerized by his handsome looks. Word soon reached the king. He decided to have a look for himself. As he was inspecting the work done by the citizens, he was angered by the unfinished work at the point allotted to Vandi. His men brought the youth who was supposed to work on behalf of Vandi. In a fit of rage, the king took a, ch took a cane and dealt a blow with it on the back of the youth. So he beat him with the cane. The next moment, the youth disappeared after dumping a small quantity of soil at the spot allocated to Vandi. To the astonishment of all, the blow that fell on the back of the youth was felt by everyone. The king felt it, his wives felt it, every man, woman, and child felt it. It fell on sages, gods, animals, birds, and on every living species. It fell on trees, bushes, and grass. It was the Lord who received the blow, but he lived in every living being. So the blow was ex experienced by every living being. Now, it's a very quaint, uh, simple story, uh, but uh, it's a way of conveying to the popular mind. This is one way in which the great truths of Vedanta, that there's one self in all, one Brahman in all, uh, now it takes a personal form of Shiva or, or Krishna or whatever. There are similar stories uh, about Krishna, for example. Um, but it's a way of bringing home to the popular mind this idea that the divine uh, is not just there in the, in the, uh, represented by an idol in the temple, and he's certainly not just up in heaven like the Christian uh, God, but uh, the divine is everywhere. The divine is in all. So this is just uh, a simple example of how uh, the Upanishads
although the age of the Upanishads themselves receded into the past, the message of the Upanishads was kept alive and was diffused through the whole population, uh, through, through the Indian people. So this principle of diffusion, which is one part of the working of evolution, took what had been developed in the age of the Veda and Upanishads through the principle of concentration by a small number of, of rishis uh, and later a, a gradually increasing uh, part of, of the population, but eventually through the, especially through bhakti literature, as, as Shrabindo points out here, the philosophy was expressed uh, in terms of uh, uh, that could be understand, understood by the heart and not only the mind. And so through, uh, through the, the growth of the bhakti religions, these unfortunately it declined as Shrabindo, uh, it coincided as Shrabindo pointed out elsewhere with a certain decline in uh, the vitality of Indian civilization as a whole, which led to a certain downfall and eventually uh, India came under foreign rule. But still a, not a process was occurring by which the whole of Indian uh, society was being progressively spiritualized. So this is actually the great legacy of the Upanishads as far as India is concerned. Now, uh, it turns out I don't really have very much time for the later part of what I wanted to say, which is about the relevance of the Upanishads uh, to the rest of the world in modern times. We basically covered, because of course, after the uh, age of the Upanishads in India and the, the Greek philosophers, different civilizations kind of diverged along their own lines. Uh, Greek, uh, uh, Greek or Roman civilization developed in one way, Chinese civilization in a different way, although it was of course deeply influenced by Buddhism which came from India. Uh, so there were interactions, but uh, different cultures remained separated by barriers of space. Uh, and possibilities of communication for many centuries. But then in the last couple of centuries, all that has broken down. So the whole world is coming together again. And uh, there gradually, uh, beginning in, in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries, uh, Indian philosophy and particularly the Upanishads began to influence key thinkers, uh, for example, in, uh, in Germany, the idealist philosophers, uh, most notably uh, Schopenhauer, Arthur Schopenhauer, uh, who uh, ascribed his own philosophy to the influence of Plato, Kant, and the Upanishads. He was one of the leading philosophers of the early 19th century, and he greatly influenced the next generation or two, not only of philosophers, but he influenced not only Nietzsche, but also the composer Wagner, the physicist Schrodinger in the uh, early 20th century. Uh, in many ways, the influence of Indian philosophy and particularly the Upanishads uh, had an impact on the development of uh, the modern West, and then of course in America you had the transcendentalists, not only Emerson and uh, Thoreau who read the Upanishads and the Gita, uh, there was also a woman, Margaret Fuller, who was often forgotten. Um, but in any case, uh, and of course then in the later uh, 19th century, you had uh, Swami Vivekananda himself, speaking at the Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1893. And then you have the beginnings of, uh, the, of the direct spread of Eastern spirituality, uh, Indian and otherwise, uh, because there were representatives of Buddhism and, and other Eastern uh, philosophies uh, through uh, Easterners, uh, from India, Sri Lanka, Japan, traveling uh, to the West. 
And so you had a new phase in which uh, the influence of, uh, of the thought of the East, uh, particularly as represented by the Upanishads and, and also in other forms such as Buddhism, was spread to the West. So um, this brings us, uh, I could have said more about that, but I want to go on to the last point, which actually uh, I needn't spend uh, very much time on uh, because it's been partly anticipated uh, by Anand before I started uh, my talk about the uh, importance of Vedanta for the world because I've been talking mostly about the influence of uh, the Upanishads first of all in India and uh, then later on on certain selected Western thinkers but still uh, a rather limited and exclusive uh, number of, of Western thinkers and I wanted to come just briefly to this question of the importance of the Upanishads for the future and for humanity as a whole. Here the basic point uh, has to do with what Sherbinder called the spiritualization of the religion of humanity. Uh, I'll just give the gist of that. I've made a, a, pass, a selection of a passage which you can read for yourselves, which doesn't actually mention the Upanishads explicitly, but the influence of the Upanishads can be felt behind this whole passage. The religion of humanity is a phrase which Rubino uses as the title of the last chapter of the ideal of human unity, uh, except for the summary and conclusion. But uh, basically the book uh, concludes with the religion of humanity. But the religion of humanity is not Sherbindo's own expression. It already existed. It was coined in the 19th century. It's also, in a very specific uh, sense, uh, by a Frenchman named Auguste Comte. But it is also used in a broader and somewhat freer sense, and it can be taken as representing the secular humanism, uh, which was formulated uh, philosophically by the, philosoph the philosophers of the Enlightenment, French uh, thinkers like Voltaire, Kant in Germany, and others. And of course, it was represented, the ideals were represented by the French and American revolutions, particularly the formula, the, the motto of the French Revolution, liberté, égalité, fraternité, liberty, equality, fraternity. Uh, now, Sherbindo uh, talked at some length about the remarkable achievements of this religion of humanity in the form that it took in the 18th and 19th centuries, but he points out that this was an intellectual and sentimental uh, religion of humanity. Sentimental in the sense of appealing to the emotions. Uh, it uh, had an intellectual side uh, as represented, represented by the, uh, the thought of that period, but also the emotional side represented by the humanitarian ideals of uh, uh, philanthropy and and uh, so on. Uh, what are now what what has now taken the form of human rights activism? The human rights activists are are, are, the, are today among the most active uh, representatives of this religion of humanity. Its importance was, as Schrebinder points out uh, at the beginning of his, the, his summary and conclusion, that it represents the highest active ideal of humanity collectively at present. But that in itself is not uh, the idea that Sherbindo ends with. His, his, his own contribution is that this intellectual and sentimental spirituality, uh, a, a religion of humanity, um, admirable as it has been in terms of what it has achieved in a couple of centuries, is incomplete. Uh, 
as, until it spiritualizes itself. That uh, it, the, the religion of humanity has to spiritualize itself and he describes quite specifically how that has to happen. He takes the uh, mantra of the French Revolution, freedom, equality, brotherhood, as representing the, the ideals of this religion of humanity. And he points out freedom, equality, brotherhood are three godheads of the soul. They cannot be really achieved through the external machinery of society. When the ego claims liberty, it arrives at competitive individualism and, and so on. He goes on and shows how the egoistic forms of these three end up conflicting so that a society that pursues liberty is unable to achieve equality. A society that aims equality will be obliged to sacrifice liberty. This is the problem with the intellectual form of these ideals. He gives the solution in the last paragraph, which I've selected here, yet is brotherhood the real key to the triple gospel of the idea of humanity. But of course, it's something deeper than brotherhood. It's unity, in fact. The union of liberty and equality can only be achieved by the power of human brotherhood, and it cannot be founded on anything else. But brotherhood exists only in the soul and by the soul. It can exist by nothing else. When the soul claims freedom, it is freedom of its self-development, the freedom of the self-development of the divine in humanity, in all its, in its whole man, in all his being. When it claims equality, what it is claiming is that freedom equally for all and the recognition of the same soul, the same Godhead in all human beings. When it strives for brotherhood, it is founding that equal freedom of self-development on a common aim, a common life, a unity of mind and feeling founded upon the recognition of this inner spiritual unity. These three things are in fact the nature of the soul, for freedom, equality, unity are the eternal attributes of the spirit. And of course, these are central ideas of the Upanishads. You see it in the Isha Upanishad where he talks about the, uh, the self in all, all in the self, and it says uh, that he in whom it is the self who has become all beings. Um, or he has the vision of unity. Ekatvam anupashyata. Uh, Ekatva is unity. Uh, can no longer have delusion or grief, etc. I uh, can't at the moment locate Shribino's translation. But in any case, this is the gist of the Upanishads, this vision of unity. The idea of equality was, uh, uh, of course, developed uh, to its fullness in the Gita. Uh, with the idea of sarvam brahma, samam brahma, uh, uh, the equal brahman in all and the vision of, of equality uh, uh, and yoga as equality, samatvam yoga uchate, based on that vision of the equal brahman, the same brahman in all, the same self in all. Likewise, of course, freedom is in a sense the key word of the whole of Indian spirituality, freedom, but the true spiritual freedom, not an external political freedom, but an inner freedom. So in this sense, uh, in fact, the religion of humanity in its intellectual and sentimental form as represented by the uh, what's called secular humanism, uh, re human rights activism, and, and these things has uh, come up against a certain problem because of its insistence on its own secularism. The rejection not only of the religious institutions of the past, which of course had to be rejected to make room for a new ideal, but the rejection even of the spiritual impulse itself, as if there was a conflict between the mental, intellectual, ethical, idealistic effort represented by this uh, secular humanism as if there was a conflict between that and the spiritual impulse. In fact, the spiritual impulse fulfills rather than contradicts everything that these intellectual uh, attempts to uh, improve 
and reform and uh, human life and to overcome the barriers between human beings to overcome all of these divisions and so on. What's sometimes called the, uh, this problem of the other, seeing others as other. Well, this is one of the basic uh, uh, themes of the, of the Upanishads. There's, uh, in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, there is, there's a passage uh, that says that where other sees other, where other hears other, knows other, etc. Uh, these, uh, it, in, the, in the end, it, inclu- it concludes Sarvam Tamparada, Yo Anyatra Atmana, Sarvam Veda, all betrays him who sees all elsewhere than in the self. As long as we have this divided vision of seeing others as other, we're not going to be able to solve our problems. And now because of the forces created by globalization, it has become impossible uh, to solve our problems in the old way. Something new is needed. And the central key, in a sense, to what is needed now to, to solve these problems created by uh, globalization, which is leading to reactions, uh, the form of nationalism, also all sorts of sectarianism, uh, and ethno, you know, uh, ethnic conflicts and so on. All of this narrowing of the sense of oneself. The sense of oneself has to be broadened. The uh, secular humanists tried to do that, but because of their refusal to admit of the truth of spirituality but because of their uh, determination to re- reject all forms of religion and spirituality, they've ended up with something that cannot satisfy the mass of humanity. So the spiritual element has to come back, but not in the forms of the past. It's precisely by the spiritualizing of the religion of humanity that it has to be done. Sherbindo says in the uh, the last chapter of the ideal of human unity, a spiritual religion of humanity is the hope of the future. But the, the word spiritual is the key uh, because the religion of humanity also has been tried, uh, dethroning God and substituting humanity in, in the place of God as the Godhead to be worshipped. That was tried, but as long as it remains just uh, an intellectual and emotional uh, humanism uh, it cannot succeeded it cannot succeed in overcoming the, the the basic problem of human egoism which requires some kind of a spiritual transformation so this in the end is where the ideal of human unity converges with Schrebinger's other works which describe how this is to be done on the indi- by the individual as explained in the synthesis of yoga and, and so on. Uh, it may seem odd at first sight if the religion, spiritual religion of humanity is the hope of the future, that he doesn't mention it anywhere else in his writings. But of course, all of his writings end with some kind of vision of the future, which always involves the idea that humanity must be spiritualized. And this... Uh, the spiritual religion of humanity is the way he talks about that in the context of his analysis of the course of human political history uh, uh, in terms of the growth of larger and larger aggregates and the eventual possibility of uh, some kind of collective uh, human unity, a world government or world federation. But this could also be a danger if, there's, if the sense of our common humanity does not become a living sense based on a spiritual realization of oneness and not just uh, an outward institutional uh, realization of oneness through pol- the result of political and economic developments. So this is where Sherbindo's works all come together and even though he mentions uh, he doesn't mention the Upanishads by name when he talks about the spiritual religion of humanity. That, uh, the key to that really is, is what was developed uh, 
to a greater degree than anywhere else in the spiritual literature of the world was developed in the Upanishads, this vision of human unity, the one self in all. The key is there in the Upanishads and, in, and it's what humanity needs today and for the future. So the Upanishads are not just something that has come down to us from some distant past, but they're more relevant than ever today and they're relevant not only in India but to all human beings. So I think I'll end with that.